Okay, Pete, it's very nice to have you with us today. Thank you for uh, being on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, so can you please tell us about uh, uh, what you were doing before real estate and, uh, and what brought you to real estate and, uh, you know, what, what have been the stages of your, uh, of your career, what you do now? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I grew up in the Midwest, um, uh, got into, uh, I was in law enforcement and made a shift into uh, business uh, in the early 90s. And as, uh, through that process, I ended up uh, in the mobile home park uh, space. Um, I was actually uh, working for a gentleman while I was going to college, uh, block leveling and selling mobile homes. And so I got the, the hand-on experience of, of how to put mobile homes together and put them, put them on parks. And we did uh, two park developments. Um, so we, we actually have acquired a couple of parks and done some expansion on those. And as part of that process, uh, we were a, a retail street dealership. Uh, so we actually sold the mobile homes, uh, both retail and into our community and that we were developing. And then, uh, shortly thereafter, I went to work for champion home builders and I was a regional sales manager, uh, for champion home builders. Um, and then subsequently for colony homes. So I've been in the manufactured housing uh, space, you know, as a working on the on, uh, block leveling and setting the grunt level and doing all the hard work and then went into retail and then went into wholesale. And then in uh, uh, 1998, um, I bought three mobile home parks in Tucson, Arizona, which is where I, I live now. And uh, we bought three parks here and they were all rehab projects and uh, uh, moved here in 98. And then about two years later, uh, I got my real estate license and moved into the brokerage side of the business. Uh, we did acquisitions uh, for a number of years uh, while I had my license. Um, and then subsequently went on to uh, uh, run the Keller Williams franchise down here in Southern Arizona. We had three offices and 500 agents. And uh, five years ago, uh, I guess it'll be in July, um, I stepped out of leadership uh, with Keller Williams and we launched what's now the Stratton Real Estate Group. And so uh, we're a we're still affiliated with Keller Williams, um, but we have our own location and we have a couple different divisions. Uh, we have a residential uh, division. Uh, that division, that team uh, will do about 600 sales in the Tucson market uh, in residential home sales this year. Uh, we have a commercial uh, component that specializes only in multifamily and mobile home parks. And uh, that piece of the business we've expanded um, so that we've got six brokers in four, four different states. Um, uh, Texas, Illinois, Florida, Arizona, and Oklahoma. And then uh, about this time last year, uh, we acquired a property management company um, and started providing those services. So as we were doing brokerage um, and our clients had property management needs, we had a property management component to service that. And so that's kind of what our business looks like now. Um, we, we added on, I guess we did uh, invest into an insurance company this year um, uh, probably about six months ago. And so we have added a, a property and casualty insurance business to that. So a one-stop shop. We're getting pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> I still, I can't cook. I still can't cook. So <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so why Tucson? I saw, I saw also, I saw uh, on your Facebook feed that you were, uh, you published something about Tucson having, uh, some, uh, some success these days in the ranking. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of cool. There's an article that came, just came out uh, probably about two and a half weeks ago and, and uh, uh, the magazine that ranked uh, out the top 10 cities um, that would be, have the best recovery uh, after the COVID. And so uh, Tucson was ranked out, yeah. So uh, we're, we're uniquely set um, to come out of the back end of the COVID and the lockdown. And, and we've got a lot of good things going here in Southern Arizona that are, that's really good for investors, um, especially in the multifamily side, just because COVID has had such an impact on the multifamily segment of commercial real estate. And so we're, we're pretty excited about that. So it's a good place for investors that they're looking as it's, it's going to be a great market for the next couple of years as some other markets certainly aren't going to enjoy that. They're going to struggle. What is going to make it a, a strong place, a strong market? Well, we've got the, the housing market um, is still doing fantastic. You know, on the residential housing market, um, you know, uh, we've got 33% less inventory April of this year than we did April of last year. Um, so we're still very much in a seller's market here and uh, limited supply. Um, 
we've got a lot of uh, large uh, corporations and uh, government um, contracts here. Um, so it's a little, little bit unique um, compared to Las Vegas, you know, where they're so entertainment and service based, you know, they're, they're getting decimated. And of course, a lot of, of those workers fall into the multifamily side as tenants and renters, mm -hmm. right? So the impact to, you know, Orlando, uh, Oklahoma City, uh, Dallas, maybe Austin, um, Las Vegas is going to be immensely greater. We're coming out of the lockdown. People are going back to work um, as the unemployment benefits uh, that, that they've scaled up roll off, you know, in the end of July. Um, most of our service industries will be back up and we'll have that revenue flowing. So as they drop off, um, the limitations for uh, landlords to do evictions, um, we should be at the end of that cycle. Um, our property management company, um, we had 99% rent collections um, in, the, in both the last two months. Um, so I think we only had two, two residents out of the entire portfolio that we had to work with uh, for non-payment because of the COVID issue. So uh, we were really, and I, there's two other uh, property management companies here in Tucson that have portfolios uh, over 400 units that I met with last week, and they were in the 95th percentile for rent collections as well. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds pretty, pretty reassuring. Um, what brought you personally to Tucson? Oh, well, I, I grew up in South Dakota, uh, so I wasn't as far north as you are, but uh, I, was still, I was still in the United States. I didn't, I didn't jump the border, but uh, North Dakota and South Dakota. And, you know, it, um, uh, as we, I was actually living in Pennsylvania, and I was a regional sales manager for uh, Colony Homes back there in the manufactured housing industry. And as we started looking for investments, you know, you can, you can pick where you want to go. And so um, we chose warm weather, first of all. Um, and we don't have a lot of the natural disasters. Uh, you know, we don't have uh, typhoons. We don't have hurricanes. We don't have tornadoes. Um, you know, we have incredible heat. Um, there's no frost lines. You have water line break. We don't have to dig down 10 feet. Um, so, you know, from an investor standpoint, um, it made a lot of sense for that perspective. And in 98, uh, it was, Tucson was kind of under the market, uh, under the radar. Um, you know, Phoenix was, was really starting to catch uh, traction with growth. And Tucson was just far enough south. It was kind of off the radar. Um, affordability, uh, the cost per unit was fantastic. Um, so it was just, uh, it made a lot of sense for us. What type of property uh, would you go after? What type uh, of property? Now or? Back then and now? Yeah, back then, um, you know, we, uh, you know we, we started off on a shoestring, you know, so it was, um, we put all what we had into the, the parks. We started off with small parks. And uh, originally we started off not even with parks. We actually started off with mobile homes. Um, in South Dakota, we bought the mobile home and we couldn't afford the park. So uh, over the course of a year or two, I think we had um, 18 or 20 mobile homes that we owned and rented out. Um, and then we sold that as a package. Um, we also had a, a small, we had started a limousine company back then. And so we sold those two and we used that to parlay into mobile home parks. And uh, the parks that we bought here um, were, um, they were not pride of ownership. They were resets. Uh, <laughs> We were buying projects because that's what we could afford. And uh, so we took on the properties that a lot of the people wouldn't take on, you know, and we kind of got a reputation for that here in, in Southern Arizona. You know, we'd go in and we'd buy parks that, you know, were 50, 60% vacant, um, you know, rough tenancy, um, you know, serious you know, deferred maintenance. And we would go in and into those neighborhoods and reset the property. And kind of our, our idea behind that was, you know, People that lived in those neighborhoods could live in a very, very nice small park, or they could live across the street in one that was not nice and had a ton of deferred maintenance and had all kinds of tenant issues and pay almost the same amount of money. And so we were able to top grade our tenancy by doing that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we would take them to about uh, 70%. And then uh, we would look maybe year three, four, we'd look at doing a 1031 exchange and rolling out of them or providing seller finance and coming out and carrying paper. Oh, I see. How would you uh, get into them in terms of debt? Would you uh, get also seller financing? Yeah, the properties that we took on, we just couldn't get bank financing, you know, and, and even now on the brokerage side of it, you know, anything under a million dollars on the park, if we're talking about mobile home parks, not apartments. Um, it's, it's incredibly tough to get bank financing. And then if there's a large uh, park owned component, the park, 
it makes it almost impossible. Um, so you're either going to end up with seller financing or soft or hard money, depending on the relationships that you have. Okay. And yeah. uh, when you look at parks, do you prefer them with a uh, few uh, park on homes or what, what's your, what's your yeah. take on this? So my, my, my first go arounds, they were all park owned. Um, and I, I did it because a lot of people didn't want to do them. You know, they just, uh, and that's always been kind of our philosophy is just go where I'm not competing against the masses. Right. And so we were able to typically, you know, they were harder to finance. Um, there was fewer buyers for them. So typically we could get much better terms um, from the owners. Um, and that allowed us to reset the property, um, convert the rentals into um, sales and carry chattel and carry paper back on the units. Um, and then end up with parks that were all tenant owned. And then you had the income coming from the lots and then the income coming from the, the, the notes on the units that we were carrying financing on. Can you go into those? Uh, Cause I'm sure you must have been very creative in terms of financing and, uh, and even the notes you, you granted tenants. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on those? Sure. Um, you know, it's uh, um, you know, some of the, we, we learned that typically in the springtime, um, January, February, uh, March, maybe uh, was the best time of the year um, to try and sell those units uh, to the tenants or people off the street. Um, typically they were getting their income tax returns. And so at uh, that time of the year, so they typically had a little more cash um, for a down payment. Uh, we, we have been known to take pickups in on trade. <laughs> Chickens, you know, it, you know, you just, you have to get creative about how you're going to help them get into it, you know, but, for a lot of for a lot of folks, you know, that were at that income level, you know, this is they didn't want to be an apartment complex. They had kids. They wanted to have a yard. You know, they wanted to be able to let the kids go out and play. And and if they weren't going to do this, then probably it was an apartment complex, and that was one of the advantages they were giving up. And, and so, you know, typically they were um, pretty good about making payments. Uh, they understood that you know they were they were getting into a home where probably they weren't, they weren't financeable with the local bank for, for something better than that. And so it was a really good first step for them working on their credit and building that. So um, taking it on trade, um, buying used homes um, out of other communities or communities that were closing down, um, foreclosed units, bringing them into the park, setting them up and then creating financing. And that's how we fill a lot of our vacancies. Okay. And um, would you always collect a down payment? Yeah, I think, well, you know, uh, we had a, a park back in uh, Springfield, Illinois. Uh, and it was probably right at 100 units. And uh, that park, uh, we had one unit in there, I think, that we had sold three times in about a five-year period. Um, you know, and, and we went in and fixed up the unit and put central air on it and those kind of things and sold it. And, and they walked, the tenants walked away from it, the owners. Uh, they walked away from it. They didn't. We offered to buy it. They just didn't want it, right? And so uh, I think that might have been the only house where we didn't take a down payment from the next person coming through. But yeah, we, we typically try to get just, just they've got some skin into it and, and mm. you know, they're bought into what they're doing. Okay. Yeah. Um, why, why is it so important so, so that the listeners understand? Why is it so important to, uh, to get the tenants to buy the homes? Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at it from an investor's perspective, I think, you know, um, Converting the, the park owned units um, to tenant owned, um, two things happen. Um, one is they, they have an ownership mentality instead of a, a, a renter's mentality. And so, you know, how they see the park, how they see the community, how they see their home is just different because they own it. They're, they, they're an ownership. Um, you know, so that was, uh, that was definitely part of it for us. Um, you know, from a cost perspective and from a return perspective, um, that was where all the expense was, was on the units. You know, the air conditioning, uh, you know, the refrigerators, the stove, the hot water heater, you know, all the damage, the maintenance, the turnover, the carpet, the wear and tear. So when you look at it from how much money we were getting for lot rent versus how much you were liability and expense we were taking on for just the, the additional revenue we were taking in rent, we just replaced that revenue with uh, income from the notes that we created on the house plus interest. And it allowed us to elevate our, our lot rents a little bit, get the quality of the park up. And ultimately from a long-term exit strategy, it just, it makes a lot more sense. Mm, okay. Um, what type of MSAs 
would you buy in like you talk about illinois uh do you look for larger communities or are you okay to have parks in smaller communities yeah you know um i'm kind of the probably the exception to most investors um the size of the community doesn't that just doesn't mean a lot to me um, i grew up in south dakota we owned a park there and um there was a park in a little town i think there was 3,000 people in it, something like that. Um, you know, and it's a farming community, it's rural. You know, their families live there, their families work, you know, uh, in agriculture and the different communities and the different businesses around agricultural, and they want to be close to their family. And so you're always going to have that kind of tendency. And so it, it just doesn't, it doesn't, a large, large community um, park, that's probably a different story. But if you're looking, you know, for those 75 unit and under, um, I think, you know, when you start looking at the larger, uh, larger parks and you know you get into a little better quality of, of, of in, uh, great investments then you start looking at you know the a different split between what the single the price of a single family residence is in that community and what you can get a, a, a mobile home for and and the difference in costing between lot rent and the cost of a mobile home versus what they could go buy you know an entry level single family residence for and so you start looking at those things um, 100,000 people um, in a, in a community is a great place. Um, for us, we've just, we've just done them in, in much smaller communities because that's what our background is. So we just have a higher tolerance for it. Okay. You know, I think as, you know, as we're talking to investor clients, you know, I think it just, that everybody's looking for that, that perfect investment, you know, um, and if we're just talking about the park space, not the apartment space, you know, the uh, all city utilities, you know, a hundred units, um, you know, 20 to 30 percent under comparable lot rents you know no deferred maintenance or very little deferred maintenance you know so there's that's you know the, the golden goose that everybody's looking for and so you know the the park side of the of commercial real estate the mobile home parks um, have gotten very very competitive in the last decade um, you know you've had big names warren buffett and, and those come into the space Tenzel, and you know that it's changed and you've gotten a lot of um, small investor groups uh, that have come into the space and uh, have gotten very aggressive and you know now to find some of those kind of properties you've had to go outside of some of the larger msas uh, and go a little further out especially from a traveling perspective you know if you're an investor who lives someplace else it's nice to get on a plane do a flight get off and go to your your asset and check on it and you know to find some of those better deals now it's get off the plane and go for a car ride and to go look at your asset because that's that's where the deals are mm -hmm. yeah i was going to say uh now that there is a mobile home university uh there is a democratization a little bit of this asset which has really gotten more popular and more and more people are competing for those uh for those uh products like you're saying yeah you know and i think you know in in the states you know the 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 absolute lack of, of inventory in the single family housing sector, you know, has, you know, there's the, and, and the, you know, we're on 11, an 11 year tear here, you know, uh, in the economy and what we're looking at and going, okay, you know, this has got to correct, start to correct itself at some point. Of course, then we have the COVID incident in March. Um, but it, you, you still look at it. Most, most MSAs are still in a seller's market and, the cost to get into a single family resident residence uh, is high enough that there's there's this big gap of need for entry level housing and not a lot of inventory to solve it and so you just have this constant pressure on the supply and demand about what's available in the marketplace and it's it's re it's really created for some unique uh nuances in our in our space that you know there we should be, you know it should be we should see new developments coming online you know that local municipalities would, would get excited about having new manufactured housing communities uh come online and you just you're just not seeing that and you're starting to see some of the cities around the country in colorado california uh, where the cities have actually gone out and acquired mobile home parks and they've become the owner of the parks to protect that entry-level housing um, that it doesn't get bought and resold and reconverted into, you know, commercial development, retail, you know, high rise, multifamily, whatever it's going to be. Mm. And um, in terms of uh, managing those mobile home parks, um, do you have any interesting strategies in terms of repositioning them and uh, turn, doing a turnaround? Yeah, you know, it, it, you know, 
it really, it really comes down to, you know, you've either got infrastructure issues, um, you know, tenant issues, um, management issues, ownership issues, and you just start figuring out where the community is at and what, what problem that community has. And then we would sit down and actually write out, we call it a one, three, five, um, one goal, three, three, stra uh, three, uh, uh, priorities and then five strategies for each priority. And so where do we want the community to be in 12 months? And what are our three priorities that we need to focus on to get it there? And then here's the five strategies to execute on that. And, you know, it's, um, as we've done those different projects, you know, uh, one of the things we've learned is, you know, who, who your on-site manager is, has, you know, who you get in business with is just incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out your team and what that's going to look like to navigate through a reposition of a community is, is just about everything. <laughs> you get the right people, you can solve everything. You get the wrong ones, they, it creates for a debacle. Mm. Um, let's get into a uh, multifamily now. And uh, mm -hmm. do you have, uh, so what, what are the tendencies you, you've, you've noticed in, in, in the Tucson area in terms of, uh, and, and maybe nationwide for the multifamily sector? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here in Tucson, you know, uh, about three years ago, we started um, probably 36 months ago prior to that. Um, there have probably been no large um, multifamily new builds, you know, so our absorption rate, new, new projects coming online. Um, the last three years, we've seen 11 of them and they're large, they're more upscale. Um, so they're coming in and, and building multifamily communities that really cater to somebody that can afford anywhere between a thousand and two thousand dollars a month rent in the Tucson market, and um, they've we you know we run in the high nineties um, for occupancy, um, and again uh, the you know the, the the housing shortage here has has allowed uh, tenants to increase rents, um, not have to you know get into um, freebies and concessions. Um, and they, they've managed to navigate away from that and keep their, keep their complexes full. Um, it's, it's been very competitive from an acquisition point. Um, Tucson's been really competitive, although we've seen a lot of turnover. So you've got a, a lot of folks that have had smaller apartment complexes and being in, a, in the top of the market, they've looked at opportunities to get out now if they weren't going to hold on for some period of time. Um, seeing that at some point this market is going to shift into a buyer's market and we're going to start to see residential inventory come up and our multifamily pricing will start to taper off. And so they've really enjoyed a great market as a landlord in, in the Tucson market. You've really enjoyed it. It's, it's been a great thing for sure. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, our markets in Dallas and Oklahoma city, uh, same thing. Dallas is uber competitive. Um, just uh, on the multifamily acquisition side, um, very, very little inventory to, to get a hold of. Uh, very, very competitive. Um, Dallas is, as a city has been on fire. They've grown year over year at just a, a phenomenal rate. Um, it, and they've got the land to do it, you know. And so they've, they've had, you know, huge, huge growth, population growth. Uh, they've had large corporations move their headquarters there that have given some really uh, decent paying jobs. Um, Toyota, the factory out there, um, you name it, all the, all the factory campuses up in Plano. Um, and so it's, it's been uber, uber competitive. We've had to actually had to go um, three, four, five hours outside of Dallas and looking for multifamily opportunities for our investors. Um, so we had to stretch away from the Metroplex and get away from that a little bit. Oklahoma City, same thing. Amazon opened up their new build center right up at the airport there, uh, by John Wayne Airport. Um, brought in a bunch of jobs. Um, the city's done a great job of redeveloping the downtown core of Oklahoma City. Um, and there's, there's some good opportunities there. There's some apartment complexes that have had some deferred maintenance, you know, that lower B and C stuff, um, large enough that it makes sense for some of the investors to come up out of the Dallas market or come down from Kansas City and participate in the Oklahoma, Oklahoma City market. So that's, that's been a really good market for us. Interesting. Thank you for this overview. And uh, so you're in sales also, and um, what are the strategies you have to find products to sell? How do you go about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, uh, 
We're a little bit unique. Uh, we've run a, an inside sales department the last couple of years. And so uh, we had virtual assistants that worked for us full time. Um, it was difficult figuring that piece of it out. Um, uh, doing the data scraping, the data mining, um, coming up with a list of apartment owners, um, figuring out, uh, you know, good numbers, um, getting good data. Uh, we used um, speed dialers. Um, and then we had inside sales guys. Um, so they would come in and they would be on the phone for you know, five, seven, eight hours a day, and they would be calling three, anywhere between one and three uh, apartment owners at a time uh, through the speed dialers, uh, giving us opportunities. Uh, you know, in a five hour call session, they could probably make 700 phone calls, something like that. Um, usually have somewhere around 30 contacts and start identifying long term nurtured people that would may not be interested in selling their. Uh, their apartment complex today, but over the next 12 months, and then we would put them on a drip campaign where they would come back into our queue once a quarter, get monthly newsletters, texts, emails, and then we just stayed in a relationship with them until they were ready to sell. Smart. Um, and you're in sales, so and you've been the head of sales for different companies. Uh, what are the keys to uh, being a successful at sales, according to you, in your experience? Yeah, I think, you know, from a, you know, we, uh, I've run the brokerage and now we have a large, large team and it's a little bit unique. You have uh, a lot more flexibility and speed, um, you know, with running a, a full brokerage with four or 500 agents, you have to, you, you, the salespeople, you know, you've got a service to everything, right? Um, being on a large team, we have more control to be more specific. I think uh, the number one rule is specialize. Um, just get really, really, really good at one or two things and, and then double down on those. Um, rather than trying to be a generalist to everybody, um, just get known for something. And, you know, deals start to swirl inside, you know, buyers and sellers start to know that's what you do and you specialize in it. And then you just open up territory. And that's been a really good strategy for us. You know, getting, I was known for owning in, in parks as, a, as an owner operator. And when I got my license, then people, hey, somebody wants to sell a mobile home park, call Pete. And, you know, we built off of that and then we just added a couple of guys that just did apartment complexes and they just got known to doing that. So, and, and then, then it's just a matter of geography, how, how big you want to go and how big of a footprint you want to leave. Um, that's number one. Uh, number two is on the sales side is lead generation. And, you know, it's just coming in as old school sales. It's coming in every day for two and a half to three hours. You pick up the phone and you call somebody else that owns a piece of uh, investment real estate. And you just have a real estate conversation. Um, you know, I think that's just really, really important. I think it's uh, having that rhythm in your business um, is the, the lifeblood of the sales side of the business. And the third thing is just um, your knowledge, uh, you know, getting, getting really, really knowledgeable on a space, you know, so that people start to look at you as that expert, see you as that go-to person that can have a high level conversation around a product or an inventory type or a geography. And, it starts to swirl and it'll, it'll serve you well as a, from a sales perspective, for sure. So what's your expertise is in mobile home parks. Yeah. 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 We, um, you know, we've done, uh, we've done a lot of multifamily, um, both in the brokerage side and from an investment perspective, you know, we've, we've partnered up with clients, you know, on, on different investment opportunities in the past. Um, and it's just, uh, I like mobile home parks. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, you're not going to go to the country club and necessarily uh, compete with the boys that own uh, uh, one West uh, downtown Chicago uh, building, but uh, they it's, it's a unique asset type. Um, we're in a market right now where there's such demand uh, for that entry level housing that um, that niche is going to have a really nice life cycle uh, the next number of years. Um, multifamily because of what has gone on with COVID and people being able to work from home, uh, people have, doing zoom uh you know that, that's going to change i was listening to a, a, a gentleman the other day and he was talking about the number of people that were living in the rents in downtown san francisco and now because they've closed the offices uh, they can move out to oakland uh, from, that are renters they can move out 45 minutes and cut the, their cost of their rent almost in half because they don't have to be there to be in the office every day because They've taken their. They've decided to take their offices virtually. So there's definitely going to be a lot of movement in the multifamily side. Um, mm. I, I think this year, 
of people repositioning, moving to a different geography altogether because they can be virtual for work. Um, and, you know, cost of living plays into it. So cities like Tucson, where our cost of living is so low, um, you know, and if they're able to live here, uh, you know, for a fourth or you know, greater uh, than you would be in a, in a large metro in, in, in California, that's been pretty appealing. Are there many other cities as Tucson? Do you know of any in terms of uh, cost of living? Yeah, yeah, there's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Omaha, uh, Salt Lake City's done really well. We've done really well. Um, Oklahoma City is, is fantastic. Um, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas has, has done really good. Um, Des Moines has been a, a really good market map. Um, I try not to pay too much attention once we get, um, it gets cold, so I stop paying attention. <laughs> yeah, and there's and there's several markets in the in the Florida market that have done really well. You know, if you look at them from a growth perspective, um, out of the top ten last year, I think there were six in Florida. Uh, the cost of living is a little different, um, but you get into some of the interior, you know, Orlando and south of that into Central Florida, uh, they've done really well there. Mm. And our our product is really prevalent down there. I pay attention to that just because there's so many manufactured housing communities and RV communities. In, in Florida, especially Central Florida. Yeah. Um, if you had somebody approach you with a million dollars, what would you recommend them to do with it? <laughs> uh, mercy. Well, after a really good dinner. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think it, uh, the multifamily space, um, I, I, especially on the park side, um, just because of, of where we're at space and time and what's going on with the economy and the markets. Um, it, make a really wise choice with that um, in that space and that's gonna serve you really well for a lot of years, um, both from a cash flow perspective, a cash on cash return, but also from an equity position. Um, I can tell you, I think um, one, of the, one of the biggest lessons I, 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 I had to learn a little bit the hard way um, is when I started off in investing in, in parks and then moved into brokerage is um, I had this mindset that I had to do everything myself. You know, that we, that we, we had to own it, we had to operate it. We would only do the deals that we could afford to do. I think looking back, um, I didn't understand leverage as well. You know, and so now I think it's, um, to your point about a million dollars, um, my first thought was again, what would I invest it in as a sole owner, right? Um, partnerships are huge. Um, I think we own six businesses and we're partners in all of them. And so it's, it's finding somebody who's really good at something that you're not, um, or has an expertise that you don't, you haven't developed their skill or you haven't failed through and they've already paid the price and learn from their education and then partner and, you know, uh, do things together that it's very difficult to do by yourself. Um, so, you know, I'm very opportunistic, you know, we are part owners in a meal prep company. We have an insurance business. We have a residential business, commercial business, property management. And it's, it's, it's really been, we've tried to keep it close to what we're really good at and keep, you know, our ecosystem of our investments very close to what we do very, very well. But as we've started to explore other investment opportunities, we're always looking for who we can get in business with that needs our, our skills or our talents, or our expertise, and they bring something to the table, whether that's equity or opportunity or, um, relationships or property. Mm. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received or you wish you had received? <laughs> um, probably what I just talked about. Yeah. Um, I actually, I can remember this. We actually sold a park. Um, we were doing a 1031 exchange and, uh, <laughs> um, we decided, my youngest brother was uh, in business with me at the time, and we decided we were gonna buy uh, a hotel. So we went down and looked at some hotels in Texas on the I-35 corridor. I lived in Arizona and he lived in Illinois. And so we flew to Texas, we met, and um, had a gentleman reach out to me that I know and said, hey, um, there's a very, very la large franchise owner in the hotel industry um, that would have a meeting with you if you're interested. And I said, absolutely. Put the U-term and we drove over to Louisiana, we met him. And one of the, I, I basically, I asked him five questions. And one of the questions I asked him is, if you had to go back and start all over again, what would you do differently? And he said, I would have taken on partners uh, early in my career. He says, it took me, I, 10 years in, I started doing that. 
and you maximize strengths and you minimize liabilities and you have the collective wisdom of, of several people. And so I think that was, it's just always resonated. I've never forgotten that. And we've, we've done a much better job of implementing that into our businesses and it's served us very well. So you've mentioned 1031 exchange and uh, 31 exchanges a few times. Uh, how do you go about them? Because I think the, the window of time is not, uh, is not that long. And uh, so first you find something to buy, then you sell or how, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, yeah. So you can either do a, a standard 1031 exchange um, where you actually need to um, sell that and that starts off your timelines. And so you, uh, once you put a, a property in escrow, you have 45 days um, from that date that you're closed to identify um, three replacement properties. Um, there, you can go above three replacement properties, but there's a whole set of um, uh, rules that come into play that make it very difficult um, to do more than three. Um, so most people tend to do three or less. And um, you have to bring in the same amount of equity, same amount of debt, um, and you move, move into your new opportunity. Um, so whatever equity you had in your previous, you need to roll it forward into your future opportunity. And you've got six months from the day that you closed um, to close escrow on it. So you basically have two timelines running at the same time, the 45 day window to go find the properties that you want to acquire to defer uh, the tax exchange. And then you, you have six months um, to actually close on those opportunities. Yep, it's, it's been fantastic. 1031 exchanges are a, a fantastic tool um, you know, to roll, defer your taxable gains and your sales into a future property and use that to, to leverage down and build additional equity and wealth. Um, there is a, what they call a reverse 1031 exchange and you can do it the opposite way uh, where you can actually buy your replacement property first and then the timelines run backwards on the, and then you got to, you have a, the six month window to sell your existing property. So it um, depends on what market you're in and how aggressive you are with your pricing and, and um, as a seller, how realistic you're going to be about what you're going to do to get that property sold. So they're not done a lot and they're not super common. The 10, a standard 1031 exchange is, is, is much, much more common. Okay. And what would you recommend a, a newbie, somebody uh, getting in real estate? Because I, you know, I, I see your story, you know, you, you taught, you, you did everything yourself and you started, you know, by uh, buying uh, homes individually. And uh, so what would you recommend to somebody starting a new? Yeah. It, on the investing side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, get a mentor. Um, you know, find somebody who's done it. Um, don't practice on your own money. Um, it's just, it's just, you know, we, we would never tell our kids uh, to do that and go to college that way. Right. And, you know, so you, you're going to pay for the education. Either you're going to pay for it in lessons learned the hard way or, you know, partner up with somebody, give up a little bit of the revenue, give up a little bit of the equity position, bring on some wisdom, bring on, you know, some experience that can walk and help you navigate through that. And I think, you know, from a, a newbie's perspective, I think um, the other thing I would say is uh, be careful who you listen to. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's always, there's always an expert, you know, we're kind of this post COVID, you know, in, in real estate on the brokerage side, you know, you have a lot of people that'll get on social media now, and this is what you should do. This is what you should do. Um, follow models and systems. Um, they work and, you know, find a system, find a model, find a mentor. Um, it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. It just will. How do you suggest to go about finding a mentor and what should be the criteria? Uh, great question. You know, I think, um, you know, I think, you know, when you, when you find somebody that, uh, you, you know, you want to be mentored by, um, there's a really good chance they're really busy. Uh, they probably have businesses they're running and opportunities, you know, so it's coming from contribution. You know, you're, you're wanting to extract their wealth of knowledge and experience. Um, it's just really tough to walk up to somebody who's very, very busy and say, hey, um, I want your time and your talent for nothing, right? So, you know, there, there's, there are some mentors that you just, you hire as a coach and they'll just coach you for a fee you know this is my fee per month I'll give you a half hour every week and we'll meet we'll go through your opportunities and I'll coach you um, or you you bring somebody on as a partner and now they're bought into your guys's futures are tied together and your outcomes are tied together and you partner up and, and do a couple trips around around the, the the infield with somebody that's done it before and then you go do your own thing if you want and what I've learned is that we've just never let go of our partners. Um, we just continue to scale 
um, if it's a good fit. And, and that's just, that's how a lot of good partnerships for us have started. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Okay, let me see if I had Um, do you see any particular uh, opportunities or things to look for after COVID? Yeah, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of movement. Um, you know, VRBOs, um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity to acquire properties that were VR, VRBO properties. Um, you know, I think they, they got hit really hard with COVID. Uh, so you're starting to see a lot of people that bought houses, lease them out as uh, VRBOs and small multifamilies as well, you know, where there's a main house and three cottages, those kind of things. So for the smaller investors, I think there's going to be some cool opportunities for some of those. Um, VRBOs as in Airbnb? Correct. Yep. Oh, I see. Yep. Yeah, we have, um, I think we have about 20 condos that we, we professionally ma third party manage. So our investors own them. We manage them fully furnished. Um, we did really good th coming through the COVID. We actually marketed to it um, and created some space for people who were afraid of being in the healthcare industry and coming home at night. And so we had some folks that were leasing from us uh, from that perspective. But I think there's going to be some really good opportunities around investments around those types of properties. Um, I think there's going to be some people are, are, in, are in some financial pain because they haven't had revenue on them and mm. probably would take a lot less than they normally would, but want to protect their credit and move away from it. Um, multifamily, especially in the, the low end, the entry level multifamily, BC, um, smaller BC stuff. I think we're going to see a lot of movement in a lot of markets um, just because of what we we're talking about with the economy, the service industries, um, non-payments, um, you know, there's, there's going to be complexes where they had, you know, 30% rent collections for a few months. And, you know, those owners, you know, if, if they bought at the top of the market and were stretched out pretty, pretty far financially, um, there'll be some deals to be had. Mm. Interesting. Um, I know you're involved with uh, a few charities. You want to tell us about them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. So, um, my business partner, uh, her name is Angie Kuzma, uh, amazing lady. And uh, um, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer uh, a couple of years ago. And she had a hell of a bat battle with ovarian cancer. And so uh, she was getting treatment at MD Anderson in Houston, uh, Texas. And uh, um, uh, went back and I actually traveled back and forth with her uh, for those treatments. And so on, on the last trip back and she got the all clear signal, um, for cancer and she was uh, good to go, uh, we decided that we'd start a 5013C nonprofit um, for women that were battling, families that were battling ovarian cancer. And so last year we had our first annual golf tournament, uh, did some fundraising, we raised $25,000. Um, uh, we put it in the fund and it was geared for offsetting housing costs and travel costs um, for women that, and families that, that are going through that battle. Um, our goal um, for that entity is to actually buy a small multifamily property uh, close to uh, the Houston metro downtown area and then reserve that for families that need to travel and have extended stay um, and provide housing for them at no charge uh, in, the, in the Houston market that, that are battling that cancer. Um, that's been our big push the last 12 months. Uh, we also do a ton with teachers um, on the residential side of our business. Um, um, if somebody refers a client that buys or sells with us, um, that's in the education or the, through our educational program, we'll donate $500 uh, of our commission off the top and they can name any teacher in, in Tucson and we've got a big four foot check and we'll take it out. And if they, if they're on the buy side and they use one of our lenders, our lenders have matched it dollar for dollar. And so we've given back about $45,000 uh, to local educators, uh, one check at a time, uh, over the last couple, three years. And it's just, a way of uh, telling them we love them and we appreciate what they do in our community and raising our kids and, and being on limited budgets. You know, here's 500,000 bucks. Uh, go take your kids for ice cream. Nice. And these are two fantastic uh, projects. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, Pete, what's next for you? What are your next, what's the next goal you're working on? Wow. Um, 
Um, we'll probably do a little more expansion uh, on the multifamily brokerage side. Um, we'll probably expand it at least two more markets this year um, from a brokerage perspective. Um, we're licensed, we can sell in 43 states. Um, so we have the ability, right now we have deals in multiple states, but uh, bringing on a couple of really talented folks that want to do commercial brokerage multifamily specifically. Um, we just uh, launched uh, our partnership with our insurance company. Um, and so we, we're, we're working really hard on scaling up that business, um, especially focusing on commercial, uh, multifamily. So really focusing on insurance products for that multifamily segment and being really competitive for our investors and our clients, uh, help and save some money with insurance there. So that's, uh, th those two ventures uh, will probably take us through most of the rest of the year. Uh, we may take a look at a mortgage uh, opportunity uh, later this month. We've, we're pretty far down the road with the mortgage opportunity. So we, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out, this, with the, what's going on, but yeah. Okay, and when you say you uh, open up to a new market, uh, how does that look like? How do you go about that? creating a new uh, office in a yeah. new market? Yeah, um, we really don't worry too much about the location. Uh, again, for us, it's always about who we get in business with. You know, so we're looking for the right person. And if that person happens to be in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, um, I guess we're going to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I won't go in the wintertime, but I'll go in the summer. <laughs> I'll, I'll go visit our expansion partner in the summertime. But it's, it really is. It's just about finding the right people um, that understand our business model and you know, we're a good fit. And, you know, we can help them and, uh, you know, we give them the, the resources they need and they get the support that they want and, and are, are able to hit their sales, sales goals. Yeah. Nice. Okay, Pete, that was very, uh, there was a lot of information. Thank you so much for, uh, for your time, for being uh, with me in the show. And thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, good luck with the rest. Sounds good. Take care. Have a great one.